I invite you right forward now to read our first lesson uh, from Isaiah 58. I'm going to be reading uh, from the New International Version, the NIV, Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 10. Uh, I, I have this Bible app, so I'm, I'm reading it from there. If you want to just follow along or hear the words of the Lord. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fasting I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will will become like the noonday. May God add a blessing to the reading of his words. And we welcome Joe Giacometti, our speaker this morning. For those of you who don't know, Joe is our pastor of youth. He's a graduate of Gordon Theological Seminary. He's a dad of three, and he takes really good care of our minivan as the service manager over at Honda North. Welcome, Joe. Okay, thank you, Sheree, for that introduction. I was not expecting that. Appreciate that. <laughs> it's a little bit about me in a nutshell. All right, this morning, let me just say a quick prayer. Father, we thank you today for, um, again, being here together. We thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that um, your message would be seen and heard through me today. Uh, and we pray that your word would just continue to transform our minds and our hearts as we live out a life of faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today what I'm going to do to start is I want to read some lyrics to a song um, that, uh, quite honestly, is a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, the song, it's by a guy named John Foreman. You hear us talk about John Foreman a lot. He's the lead singer of a band called Switchfoot, which had some notoriety and uh, fame in the, uh, for the last 20 years or so, early 2000s on, um, in the sort of Christian mainstream uh, music realm. He does some solo work. He's a great... Uh, religious thinker, philosopher, poet, songwriter, um, and so we, we reference him a lot. Um, not to lean on him, but, you know. <laughs> so he has a song called Instead of a Show. And the song format is interesting in the verse. It's kind of in a minor tone. It almost sounds grumpy and, like, aggravated, you know, like he's not pleased. Uh, and then it gets into this verse, uh, the chorus, and it, it kind of lightens up. It's a little, it's open and airy, you know, it's a major tone, um, and it sounds kind of pleasant, a pleasant reprise. Um, you know, and if I'm honest about it, sometimes I don't, I don't like listening to this song. It does make me a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, but I think the, the, the words and the point uh, are, are genuine and true. He starts very, very boldly saying, I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your praise, the hypocrisy of your festivals, 
hate all your show. No, away with your noisy worship and noisy hymns. Um, he says, I stomp on my ears when I hear you singing them. I hate all your show. And then he moves into this more grand. Instead, let there be a flood of justice, righteous living. Let there be a flood of justice instead of a show. Uh, and then he goes on. Your eyes are closed when praying. You sing right along with the band. You shine up your shoes for services. And then he says, but there's blood on your hands. So again, a bit of a convicting line. You turned your back in the homeless, uh, the ones that don't fit into your plan. Quit playing religious game. There's blood, blood on your hands. And he goes on and back into the reprise. Instead, let there be a flood of justice, righteous living, a flood of justice. And then he's like, you know, let's talk about this. Let's argue this out. We can figure this out. Um, you know, uh, just quit fooling around. And what we should be doing is giving love to those who can't love, hope to the hopeless, stand up for the ones that can't stand. And he ends again, I hate all the show, but then finishing with sort of the chorus, instead let there be a flood of justice, an endless procession of righteous living instead of a show. So I want you to keep those things in mind uh, as we consider the passage that Sheree read from Isaiah and as we move into looking at the pattern of Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 6, is where our primary teaching is from this morning, in Matthew chapter 6. And again, remember this sort of back and forth the hate versus the what we should be doing. So I'll start right in Isaiah. Or, um, I'm going to read through. There's uh, three primary things we're going to be sort of highlighting and focusing on. I'm going to read through the text and say a brief word about each of those things and then sort of uh, summarize and analyze the meaning and what, what implications it might have for us. So if you want to follow along, I, I too will be reading from Matthew or the NIV um, and because it's easier here this morning on my phone. Um, Starting at verse 1, Matthew chapter 6. We'll read uh, 1 through 18 in total, but we'll start just with verse 1. It says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So he leads off the whole conversation with this idea of not, uh, in for, not don't do them before men or other people. And so this gives us a hint right off the bat as to who the, the appropriate audience is. Now I'll go on, Matthew 6, 2 through 4. says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So first, he talks about giving to those in need. Generosity, helping those in need, is obviously encouraged as a part of our faith. Uh, we should all do this as often as we can, be as generous as we can. It's what God calls us to do. And it's how, actually, God's people are taken care of. It's one of the primary measures that God uses to take care of his own people is by his own people. There are some people that are called, and that we all should be called to help those in need. And this is how God's family is taken care of. Giving is a funny thing. You know, maybe if there's a split of people who want to give publicly and kind of seek recognition for that, be recognized and say, yeah, this person, you know, the, the so-and-so memorial fountain or whatever it is, you know. Um, but then there's uh, an equal part, it seems like, or maybe more, um, that just as soon would not have anyone know that they're giving at all or what they're giving. Certain levels of wealth, I, I, I would think, you know, whether you're a business owner or a celebrity, almost come with a pressure, an expectation to give, ch uh, to, you know, publicly to charity and things like that. So that's probably a whole other thing. Um, but it's also interesting, I've, I've spoken with some who've been involved in fundraising and some of the public events in the secular realm that they run. And they would say that there are people who, um, for, out, you know, I, I don't want to, not saying this to be judgmental, but there are people who will, really only give large amounts if they are going to be recognized publicly for it. And when they're doing uh, sort of public fundraising events, when they're asked uh, if there's not sort of recognition or notoriety, if there's a, if more of a, a private, they're not as likely to give as much. So that's an interesting take, take on it as well. So, but as for, in terms of us, as for the Christian act of righteousness, uh, we are to give generously without making a show so now we'll read the next section from Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15. He says, and when you pray, so this is the next sort of uh, act, Christian action he's going into. Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. 
Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go and the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And then he does go into this segment where he lays out sort of the, the you know, what we base our, uh, what the prayer we just read off of, the, the Lord's Prayer. And at the end of it, he says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So we consider the next element here that he's talking about, prayer. He talks a little bit about forgiveness, but I'm not going to talk too much about the, today. We'll save that for Greg, Pastor Greg when he gets back. What's interesting here in this section on prayer is that he's kind of addressing two separate groups. Usually with the term hypocrite, it's when he's talking about um, the religious leaders and the Pharisees. And so he addresses that first, like he kind of does in all, in all of this uh, segment, or in this passage. And he's saying, well, they broadcast their prayers for notoriety, and they're looking for religious prestige. Um, but in this instance, he also mentions, which I think we know is, is true and should be avoided, he also mentions the pagans, uh, the pagan practices, and how they um, go babbling on and on in their, in their words of prayer. So, you know, we already know that babbling kind of gets a bad rap in the, in the Bible. Um, and here it's kind of like a knock against the pagan uh, ways of sort of just many gods. Um, they would list what they would do, they would list and repeat the names of all of the gods that they knew or could, you know, remember, um, and in hopes that they would get the one that was going to hear their prayer and give them favor. So it was kind of a wishy-washy, you know, let's just throw it all out there and see, you know, what one will stick and which, which God might have favor on us. Um, obviously, this is foolish when we're considering the nature of the one true God and as Jesus is teaching them. Jesus lets them know that this is unnecessary. You don't need to do this, all of this re repetition in words. Um, and this is how you do it instead. And then he goes and gives us our Father, uh, the, the prayer that we're supposed to, to use as our guide. He teaches them how to pray. And what this does, it, interestingly enough, is that it, it, the, the prayer guideline that he presents, it gives the people clarity. So they kind of have this focus on what they're supposed to do in prayer so they kind of don't get lost. You know, they ha it gives them a solidity. It gives them a consistency um, so that... It, you know, it limits their ability to ramble or to stray too far out of, you know, going on and on and risk, you know, lest they risk the rambling on and on. Okay, and so the next section here, Matthew six sixteen through 18, is about fasting. It says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So fasting is an interesting, what we might call discipline. It's maybe the hardest, and you know, currently maybe, the, you know, I would say probably the least common, common, common activity that people might take part in these days um, of these four things, if we include forgiveness. Maybe some people here have fasted. You know, I don't know. Maybe many haven't. Have I fasted? Well, I'm not going to tell you that. I don't want to be obvious about it, like the passage says, but God knows. Interesting thing about fasting is we skip back to the Isaiah 58 passage that Sheree read. The Israelites were very concerned if God knew or noticed that what they were doing. And the answer that he gives really sort of expands our thinking on what, what fasting not only is, but the purpose of why it should be done. And it, it sort of uh, brings into the, 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 the fray a whole lot of other people that maybe we're not thinking about. They have the wrong motives, the Israelites. The people ask God, why don't you notice? And in verse 3, God calls out the bad motives. He says, uh, but you are doing it to please yourselves. You still oppress your workers. And so he's transitioned from the inward and then thinking about the other people around you. And then in verse 6, I'll tell you, this kind of takes a turn that I don't know they were really expecting. And as I sort of evaluated, I'm not sure I was fully expecting either. 
Um, he says, no, this is the kind of fasting I want. Now, when we think of fasting, we think of giving something up, not eating, maybe. Or in our modern days, sometimes we'll fast social media or technology or something like that. Um, and it is to you know, get closer to God, to maybe devote the time in prayer. Uh, and I think in, in, when it's done correctly, people do um, put into place something where there is sort of an outward, I'm giving up this to be able to give to something else. But the idea of fasting, when you hear that, is just like going, going without food is sort of the primary. But he says, free those. This is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. So that just goes in a whole, like, that brings a lot of things into fasting that I'm not sure on a surface level they were really thinking about or we really think about with fasting. I can imagine the people kind of looking around at each other when, after hearing that response like, oh, really? Did he answer the right question? What's he talking about? We were just trying to be, you know, go without food, uh, be hungry, a little discomfort so we could praise you and, and uh, you know, find, find your favor. But then we find out that even a relatively private dif- discipline like fasting becomes not about ourselves, not even only about God, but very much about others, God's overall people, God's family, if our hearts are in the right place. And then so fasting then kind of becomes this, almost like this glue that it opens up all of the things he's talked about in this Matthew chapter 6 passage. Because you can give without fasting and you can pray without fasting, but when you fast, you, by definition, have to be praying and should now we find out be giving or doing something that is, you know, radical almost, trying to uh, raise, lift oppression or help out people who are truly in need. And so fasting becomes this all-encompassing sort of act of righteousness that incorporates all of the things that Jesus is talking about in this passage. So these acts of righteousness, uh, this is what the Matthew chapter 6 discourse focuses on. And... Excuse me. What we have described here are several staples of the Jewish life of faith, as this was written in that time, it, or in those times. You know, the Jewish faith was actually very intertwined with life itself. So you could even say it was just simply the Jewish way of life. And today, for Christians, these are three or four of what we typically call spiritual disciplines. They are encouraged, including forgiveness, which is sort of the. It's a very foundational principle, obviously, for Jewish and Christian life of faith. But again, we're going to leave that for Greg to talk a little bit more about next week. There's a book by Richard Foster called Celebration, uh, Celebration of Discipline. And it is a book that guides through um, the spiritual disciplines in three major areas, inward, outward, and corporate disciplines. And this is a great book. I, it's been around a long time. I mean, I read it probably 20 years ago. Uh, but anyone looking really to truly dive deeper into faith, growing through spiritual disciplines, uh, this could help greatly. So I would recommend sort of getting that and going through this book. Um, the, the book does highlight specifically prayer and fasting as two of the disciplines. And then giving to those in need, I would say we could, we could lump together as a part of another discipline service, which he talks about, but also fasting, as we just kind of talked about from our passage this, today and from Isaiah. So the broader spiritual term that these can all be grouped under, I would say, is righteousness. Remember that righteousness. And that's how he starts off this whole passage. The introduction uh, labels it acts of righteousness. And so these are actions that show a commitment to a life of faith in Jesus. And then he reiterates these things, that they are not, uh, that they are to be a part of righteous living. But not just done for the sake of doing for recognition, but to be done the right way. Righteous has a bit of a moral or ethical connotation to it. And it's maybe not enough if we just wanted to kind of just simp- you know, simplify the definition. Maybe it wouldn't be enough to just say, do the right thing. We could take it a step further and say, do the right thing for the right reasons. And there's an element of integrity that it plays into that as well. So we've talked about these actions, but the point here today is not the actions themselves. Although they're all important and encouraged, they should be a part of all of our lives if we commit our lives to Christ. The point is the motivation behind doing them. 
And so this isn't necessarily a practical training on how to implement these activities. Rather, it's a bit of an inward focus, an evaluation, a reflection sort of of the mentality behind them or the manner in which we do them. So these, these outward actions that he discusses of daily or regular Christian living, again, not focusing on the outward surface level, but turning to the root of the issue. And what's that's what behind all of them is that is what's in our heart. So I want to take a look quickly at, there's three elements that repeat throughout each of the segments of this passage in Matthew that give us clues to what righteous, righteous acting shouldn't be versus what it should be. So the three things that we find in each one of these were hypocrites, the phrase reward in full, and then the conclusion, father sees in secret, what he sees in secret he will reward. So the word hypocrite, this is a dangerous one. I read in my prep that the Greek word that we get hypocrite from uh, translates to something like play actor. So think about if you go to a play, or in these days if you watch a movie. It's an actor. And so I thought about that a little bit. Think about your favorite actor or actors, actresses, whoever, and whatever roles or favorite movie, whatever role that your uh, favorite characters or actors are in. What they play, we can ultimately say about that is that's not who they actually are. Think about that statement. That's not who they actually are. So likewise, when we use this word, this word hypocrite, which is, you know, often it's a negative connotation. You can't really escape that. It's us saying, that's not who they actually are about someone, whoever you're using it. And so Jesus here repeatedly is saying, don't be like them. Don't be like the ones who pretend, because that's not who they actually are. They're not praying in public, or the ones that, sorry, the ones that do it for show. They're not giving as a benefit to the other person or for God's glory. They want to be seen or maybe they actually want something in return. And they're not praying in public for God's glory or to benefit the body of believers. In that instance, they want status. They want recognition. They're praying for selfish things. And finally, they're they're not fasting for God's glory. They're not fasting to take care of the oppressed or to get closer to God. They maybe want, even pe- want people to feel bad for him. Oh, he's fasting. Oh, he must feel so bad. Look at him. They want people to um, maybe comfort them for w- what a great thing that they're doing. Again, the recognition. If they're doing it loud or for a show, that's not who they really are. Jesus is saying that's not who God called them to be. That's not who God calls us to be. And so the next repeated term is they've already received their reward in full. So that comes after the point at which it's talking about so that men can see them. So what this is referring to is is where the reward is coming from. So if you do these things for the wrong reasons for show or for recognition, then that's it. Your reward stops there. Your reward ends with the recognition of man, which, no offense, is a pretty weak payoff. And so God is, uh, Jesus is pointing that out. Is that even really worth it? You know, the true reward is is from God. Don't sell yourself short. You're selling yourself short if you're in it for the reward from man. That will not satisfy you. It's a worthless reward. So Jesus is encouraging us to strive for your reward from God. And of course, the challenge is that often goes unnoticed. That's that's often done in secret, which brings into the next sort of the, the repeated phrase that concluded each of these segments of righteous act- actions is, uh, and ch- tells us where the true reward comes from. He says, but God, your Father, sees in secret and he will reward you. Interesting thought here is that it's not wrong to receive a reward. You know, I mean, I guess if, if we're out for just a reward or we're, we're too selfish or greedy about the reward, then that's maybe a, an improper motive. But the reward itself is not, is not a wrong. So th- as long as we desire God's reward and not man's reward. And the idea starts to be clear. Are you willing to do these things in private with no recognition for God or for those that really need them? That's the point, the, the, the purpose of sort of the whole thought process of this passage of Scripture. At the end of the passage, we can answer the question of who the audience truly is and what the purpose truly should be. We know that God is the audience, not man. 
that he is glorified, but also that humans will be properly taken care of, that his children, his family will be properly taken care of. So the takeaway is, and the question, the takeaway question is how do we achieve this? And we think about all these things he's telling us to not do and, and the manner in which to do them. How do we achieve these, these goals? And there's two things uh, I want to leave you with. It starts in your heart, and I would say be genuine and be humble. So to not be a hypocrite, kind of like the, I was thinking about what's the opposite of a hypocrite, to not be a hypocrite, we must be genuine. And for our heart to have the right, the right motives or the genuine motives, we must have humility. There's a very fine line sometimes between hypocrisy and just being human, being alive. You know, I don't want to stand up here today and tell you, don't be a hypocrite. Uh, because the bad news is, it's impossible. We're all hypocrites. It's just the way it kind of is. And it's interesting because, the, you know, that's somewhat the tragedy of Christianity. Greg gave a survey result kind of a few weeks ago in one of his messages about how Christians in general were viewed in society. And one of the primary words that came up as a part of that poll result was hypocritical. And that is our dilemma. You know, by the, by the very nature of the human condition, against sort of these lofty standards that Christ presents us with, we are hypocrites. That's why we need a savior. But the result of that salvation is the opportunity at least to be hypocrites less. This again, this dilemma of Christianity versus society is we might never be able to eliminate hypocrisy 100%. So that we're always going to have that eye on us about that. You know, so we have to figure out ways to overcome that. Even those who seem to stumble less than others or who seem to have that knack of maybe not seeming hypocritical, they'll fall into it too at times. But we can be hypocrites less. That's not really a, a PR-friendly tagline, though. Hey, be hypocrites less. Um, so what I will tell you today instead, as an encouragement, is to be genuine. Be genuine more. And if you're being genuine more, you will by nature be a hypocrite less. The idea is I'm doing this because I love Jesus and I love people. And that's your starting point, your motivation. Or if you, maybe you're struggling to love certain people, then you know what you want to you treat people with Jesus' love in those situations. The word genuine, I would say, is kind of when your actions match your words or your actions and your belief structure kind of match up and, or your worldview. Those, the intermixing of your actions, words, belief structure, and worldview that's all sort of in line. When your actions in front of people match uh, your actions when no one is around, that's genuineness. The opposite of hypocrite, like we talked about before, uh, in other words, is when someone sees you doing something and that they can say that is who that person is. Instead of saying that's not who that person is, they will say that is who that person is. And that is a mark of genuineness. And it might not happen immediately or in an instant. I think being, uh, being known as someone who's genuine might, might develop over time to be, kind of, to be realized because the people we interact with will have to see our actions and then they'll have to hear our words and understand kind of what our motivations are. Um, and that might take, you know, kind of a repeated cycle before them to be able to truly say about you that is who that is, that person is. Not that it's necessarily for them, but again, this is kind of the challenge. You know um, that people that we people see what we do, and they make a judgment. So we have to live with that. So a genuine heart, genuineness can affect your heart. A genuine heart must also be humble, and that's our kind of final: be genuine, be humble. Some might be familiar with the Purpose Driven Life. Uh, by Rick Warren. After all, it's kind of the most major uh, blockbuster, mega-selling book on Christian faith ever. Um, for those that for some reason might have missed it, uh, what it is is essentially like a 40-day devotional book on faith foundations. What it is to live a life of faith. What God is about and how it impacts our life. Uh, it, it is, it, I, I would say it's become kind of cliche. It had such a level of success and notoriety that it's, ver it's very cliche. But I don't think that means we should cast it off. I think um, I would really actually recommend reading this as well uh, if you're looking to kind of nail down an, an understanding of what the fundamentals of Christian living look like. It's a, definitely a worthwhile read, um, so consider that. But in any case, he starts off the entire book. The whole book starts with this sentence, these words. It's not about you. 
That's how he introduces the whole book of A Purpose Driven Life, what it is to live a life of faith with God. It's not about you. And I really think that this can be applied to the teaching that we see from Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. It doesn't matter who sees them, the things that we do, or that anyone sees them. What matters is that God sees them, and that is enough. It matters what's in your heart while doing them. Is it from a genuine, humble place, or are you making it about yourself somehow? And if you're making it about yourself, then that's not genuine. That's not humble. It's not about you. It's about God, God's glory. It's about the other people. Uh, There's a passage from James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, that talks about all these things together, our motives in our heart when it comes to humility and righteousness. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. This wisdom doesn't come down from heaven. It's earthly and unspiritual and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil, uh, every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere, which by the way, sincere is another a great word for genuine. And he ends with peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So we have hum- uh, genuine and humility. And the reason that I highlighted these two is because I really love how they sort of play and feed off of and into one another. It's like a cycle. You know, to be genuine itself sort of creates a natural humility. And to have a humble heart and attitude will come across to other people as very genuine in nature, having a very genuine spirit. These two qualities really can't exist kind of without the other. They really must coexist. And so that's why I think they're a good fit for our takeaway and encouragement from all of the things that that we see in Matthew chapter 6. So if we display humility, we don't care about what we look like or if we get the praise. To God be the glory. You do what's right. You take care of the person who needs it. You make sure they're all right and you disappear. Not necessarily to go away and not help them again, but just so that you're not necessarily worried about the recognition that you might get. If there's no recognition, so what? God sees what is done in secret, and our reward is with him. One last passage I want to leave you with is from Philippians chapter 2. It gives the ultimate confirmation, I think, for the requirement uh, of humility. Verses 3 and 4 says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Blowing up that balloon, that a man that was blowing up, kind of blowing up you know, your ego and your head. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. We do this in the example of Jesus. And in the same chapter, verses 6 through 8, one of the great, Philippians is a great book. Go read it. It's amazing. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, really gives like what kind of the whole concept of Jesus coming to earth is all about. He says, says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Sorry. Uh. (laughs) Joe gets emotional, sorry. But that is, um, just think about the gravity of that statement. Jesus did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. (sighs) If I knew I was equal with God, I would cling to that. But in any case. (sighs) Sorry. Verse 7. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took Now I can't read the words. Sorry. Okay, here we go. He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So humility is necessary as a response for what Jesus has done for us. So this way of righteousness that is presented to us in Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, it seems impossible. He gives us a lot of lofty goals, like there's no way we could do it on our own. And that's the point. We need Jesus. It is, in fact, made possible by the genuine and humble acts of Jesus Christ. 
So this morning I pray that we might act with the same genuine humility to carry out these acts of righteousness that Jesus has called us to. Amen. If I could have our worship leaders come forward and let's all stand and sing our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. getting our guitar set up. Take my life and let it be. So I encourage you to go with hearts that are genuine and hearts that are humble so that we might do these acts of righteousness for God's glory and for the benefit of God's children and people. Go in peace. Amen.